Hey y'all, welcome back to Speak Out with Christine Jurgen. I am your host and today's episode is one in honor of Foster Care Month. We have foster mom Jamie Finn on and she is also an author and a public speaker. She has fostered for nine years. She has six children right now, two of which have been uh, adopted from foster care, two who are biological and one who is currently a foster child who's in their home. And we're diving into foster care as a whole. What is foster care? Why is foster care used as an argument for abortion? Is, the, is abortion necessary to fix foster care? Um, and we also have a lot of questions that you guys submitted that you were interested in knowing, you know, can you adopt from foster care? How expensive is foster care? Let's debunk some of the stereotypes that foster care uh, parents are abusing the system to make money and profit off of this, which is just Totally bogus if you really know any foster families. But we go into all of this and more. She has authored a book that I want you guys to check out called Foster the Family. It's also her social media handles on pretty much every platform if you'd like to go follow her. Uh, But for now, let's jump right on into it. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us on Speak Out today. It's a pleasure to have you. I met you earlier this year in January in Washington, D.C., which was really awesome. We just kind of happened to sit next to each other at the Stand for Life conference, and you are a foster parent. I actually knew who you were on social media Prior to that, I used to, uh, used to, I still want to uh, foster at some point in time. So I would love to pick your brain and talk to you. Um, but I, for those who don't understand, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions that go around regarding foster care and uh, people don't really necessarily know exactly what it is. Can you explain what foster care is? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you. Thanks for, for having me and Um, I'm so excited to just talk about this together. So foster care is essentially um, the government's way of trying to protect children who are in homes where they're experiencing abuse or neglect. So if there is a concern about a child, a member of the community, often a teacher or a doctor or neighbor will call the local child protection agency and an investigation will happen where the worker is looking to see, is this child safe? And is there a way that we can provide resources and a support system to this family to keep them together? Or do we need to actually remove the child from the home for a period, uh, still with bringing the resources and support system, but Um, removing the child, placing them in a safe and nurturing home, which is essentially a foster home. And then the goal starts of what can we do to resource this family to hopefully bring the family back together again and have this goal of the reunification of the family. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people don't necessarily um, understand it is the reunification is the goal. Yeah, that's right. You are loving and caring for that child in the, for the time being when mom and dad may be going through something, but you are also at the same time, kind of their cheerleader and hoping that they get back on track because that's, that's what you want. That's where the child is going to be, um, given the circumstances are okay. They're going to thrive the most with biological mom and dad, but we know that that's not always the case. Um, What has, you've been a foster mom, um, what inspired you to become a foster mom and what does your journey look like so far? Yeah, I always had sort of a heart for vulnerable people, but I had a disconnect in where those people were and who they were. So I, when I was a teenager, wanted to be a missionary and go overseas. And then when I got married, it was will adopt a child from overseas. And so I always had a perspective of helping others, but it was always sort of people over there where they are and me going to them, rather than really understanding that there were needs in my community, that there were kids in my neighborhood who were experiencing abuse and neglect and needed help. And once that sort of clicked on for me, Um, I became obsessed with wanting to do something for those kids. And I knew that foster care existed. I always knew from movies and that it was a thing, but I didn't know one person in my life 
who had stepped into foster care. So it was very confusing to me, um, very much something that that wasn't a part of my everyday. But as I learned more about it, just started to really have my heart broken for these kids and eventually for their families, even though that wasn't how I initially started off. For me, it was really just about sort of rescuing the kids from where they were, rather than having that perspective like we were just talking about of the family being whole and brought back together again. Yeah. So how long have you been doing it now? We have been foster parents for over nine years. So it's 30 kids have come in and out of our home. Wow. We have six kids in our home right now, our two biological children, three adopted from foster care, and then we've had a baby with us for a few months. Wow. Now, I see a lot of people who will say, you know, I can't foster. I'll just get too attached to the kid. And I I would hate to give them back. And I can't do that. How do you respond to that? Well, first, I want to say that I said the same thing. So Mm -hmm. as much as I may end up saying that that is not how we should approach it, I understand why people do approach it that way. Because I said and felt the same things. I understand the the fear of heartbreak, that you are going to fall in love with a child and then eventually have to say goodbye to them. And I think, first of all, that that shows that you understand how vital the role of a foster parent is, that you are not looking at it as a way to just sort of give a bed to a child, but that you understand that these kids don't just need homes, they need families. They need parents. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you think you're the kind of person who's going to get your heart broken as a foster parent, then you would probably be a great foster parent. Because really, these kids need attachment. The thing that we are most afraid of, of getting too attached, is the thing that kids most need. We used to have orphanages in this country. We used to Um, really rely more on group homes. And what we know about children, about the human brain and body is that it's not just about physical needs being met. There is a deep need for connection, for belonging. And this isn't just like a feeling kind of thing. This is a brain need. Our brains need the connection of a nurturing caretaker. So we get to give the gift of attachment to these kids. And it's not just about the relationship that we share with them. It's not just a bond. Sometimes when we say attachment, we mean bond. But Mm -hmm. really, attachment is a skill that we can give these kids by um, creating an an environment where they feel safe, where their needs are met, where they learn how to ask for things and receive, this is actually a skill that they then can bring into every relationship after our home. So yeah, when that- we're giving our hearts an attachment, we are giving them the ability to attach to other people and to have those relationships after our home. Yeah, you have almost kind of wear the weight of the situation on your shoulders so that you can give them what they need to grow and, you know, become a healthy individual in the time frame that you have them with, whether that's, that's right. temporarily or whether that's, you know, permanently through adoption or otherwise. Can you, I know you said you've had 30 kids um, in and out of your home and you have adopted some. Can you share, obviously everything is uh, completely anonymous. I know you can't share um things in detail or whose name, but could you share a couple of stories maybe of the children who have come in, kind of why they're there and what that kind of looked like. So people listening can see, you know, this is why they came in, obviously not their name, but this is why they were here. This, how, how long they were here. Um, mom and dad got back on track and everything worked out. Yeah. So we've had kids from anywhere from, uh, two days to over two years. And so there is such a a variance in the need. The state is coming in quickly seeing, is this a safe 
environment for this child? And if not removing them, well, there's also going to be a plan to look for maybe a biological father, look for other family members. And sometimes there's really just, okay, mom needs uh, to get these services in place, or there was an eviction. And so now we found housing. Sometimes it's much more serious and insidious. Sometimes it's that um, it, there was a parent who was a sex offender and really can't wow. ever be caring for a child or pervasive mental health needs that really need um, treatment or maybe mean that the, the parent doesn't ever have the capacity to healthily, health, sorry, safely parent the child. So it, it really depends. We have welcomed kids who have come with serious injuries, um, babies with broken bones, the kinds of injuries that don't mm -hmm. happen by accident. Um, yeah. We've had kids who've come from nine homes before us because of running away and getting into trouble and, and having struggles in the homes, the foster homes they were in. We've had a, a lot of babies be removed immediately from the hospital because they were exposed to drugs and alcohol in utero. And um, so they know right away that that mom is struggling and needs support. So we've had lots of different stories, lots of different timelines um, and and different outcomes. Like I said, we've adopted three kids. We've had other kids move on to adoption in other families. We've had lots of kids go to caring and safe biological family members and awesome. just had to be sort of the, the waiting space while that family member was available to step in. And then we've had lots of kids be reunited with um, their biological parents and just have that time you know, we had one one little girl who mom was consistently in active addiction for 18 months and 18 months after many years can just feel like there's really no hope here. There's really no chance that that mom's going to get clean. And right. in the end, she did. She got clean. She got a place. She got a job. And she is parenting her child independently and is a loving and safe parent. So we've had outcomes that that my hope as a foster parent is that they've all been redemptive uh, for the kids and for the families in different ways, even though the outcomes have been so different. Yeah, that is... There's a lot there to kind of digest, you know, the stories of, of the children and what they've been through. There's a lot of um, things that can be seen as very heavy and, and um, heartbreaking to have to hear, much less yeah. see in front of you and care yeah, for that right. child, um, especially a baby. Like, that's a lot. I mean, what what is the rewarding aspect for you. It's so beautiful what you do, but there's no doubt in my mind that it's absolutely a tough thing. And there's a lot of effort that goes into it, no matter how wonderful of a thing it is that you're doing. What would you say is the most rewarding part of it? Yeah. Well, I believe two things deeply. One is that the hurt that happens in relationship, that healing is what happens in relationship also. So where they have a broken story with brokenness in the family and hurt and harm, they can experience healing in those spaces when they're a part of our family, when we are working towards the healing of their brain and body and beliefs while we're standing in the gap and parents are becoming healthy and, and the family is able to be together again. So part of it is just the privilege of being a part of healing. And sometimes yeah. healing looks like reunification. Sometimes it looks like adoption. But I believe that both of those are ways that, that a child experiences healing. I think the other thing is just believing so deeply that anything that is done in love for others and as unto God is just inherently worth it. That when we don't see the outcomes that we hope for and pray for, when 
a child goes home maybe prematurely and we can't see, oh, what I did was worth it and made a change. Believing that anything that I do that's serving others and seeking to glorify God is inherently valuable to him. And when it's done as worship to God, that is good work, even if I can't see how the work ended up being good. Yeah. So on the... um opposite side of that, what would you say would be like kind of the biggest misconception about foster care as a whole? I think it would be that we can sort of disentangle kids from their families and just bring me the kid, let me love them, let me heal them, let them stay here. Just a very um, simple sort of perspective of of it just being about a child, rather than welcoming a family into your family, rather than opening your heart and home and family to a whole family. It's it's a limiting perspective when we just make it about a child leaving their home and coming to our home. It's It's not all that foster care can be and should be. As foster parents, we get to play a part in a child experiencing healing, but we can also really play a part in a family experiencing healing and in changing sort of the trajectory of an entire family of breaking generational trauma by, by, playing a part in a family healing. And there are a lot of ways that we can do this practically as foster parents from praying for the parents and encouraging them to much more tangibly supporting visits and creating space outside of visits for connection and um, bringing professionals into helping kids process things that are happening in visits. And there are so many ways that we can be a part of a family being healed that are more than just loving a child in our home. You said something interesting there of, you know, how people like, just bring me the child and I'll love them and right. I'll, I, I can fix this. But regardless of what a child has gone through, oftentimes, even when they have experienced that abuse, my understanding is that they still love mom and dad or that abuse to them was all that they knew. So to them, it might be normal and they don't understand why they were taken from mom and dad, but that love is still there because the it's biological mom and dad. It mm -hmm. just kind of is inherent mm -hmm. uh, when the child is born. It, do you think the same? Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that's important to remember is about 70% of kids are removed for neglect, not physical or sexual abuse. The way that we can um, sort of limit when we think of kids being removed from foster care, we think of more traditional abuse, where most often it's neglect. Most often it's the effects of poverty, um, of mental illness that's untreated, of substance abuse that's untreated, and just children not being protected and nurtured the way they need to be. So what I think is important for us to understand is that parents love their children. So the reason that children love their parents is because their parents love them, because they have most likely experienced a lot of love and affection and happy memories. And it's not just like the movie makes it where, you know, there's this horrible abuse happening and, and kids are terrified. That can happen and it's devastating. But most often it's families that are struggling, parents that are struggling, and kids who deeply love their parents. I've yeah. had uh, kids tell me how much they love me and love my home and still how much they wish that they could go home. I've had teenagers yeah. tell me I would rather be sleeping on the floor in the hotel room than in your beautiful home. And I looked at them and said, of course you would, <laughs> because that's your mom and dad and siblings. And I'm happy that you can be safe here with us right now, but I completely understand why there is that craving in your heart for the people that you know and love. Yeah, that makes me emotional um, just thinking about that. So you kind of, my next question, you kind of touched on it, I think, because my next question was what what is the primary reason that they go in, but you're saying that it's neglect? Yeah, and neglect can be um, sort of environmental things like 
uh, a lack of housing, poverty, things like that. Maybe a single mom who is working multiple jobs and left kids home after school so that she Mm -hmm. could work. There's those situations. Neglect would also include parents just being unavailable to their children because of their own mental health or substance abuse. And so the hope is that when services come in and parents are able to get therapy and treatment or go to rehab and um, be regular on medication, that there can be healing, that then they're available to care for their kids in the way they weren't before. Yeah. Have you, so the event that we met at, the Stand for Life event was a pro-life event. Have you, are you familiar with the argument that is used to, um, I guess it brings up foster care to support the issue of abortion? Have you heard this argument before? Yeah, definitely. And I've heard many former foster youth speak out against that argument and basically say, how dare you say that my life is not worth living? When you're saying, if you let these kids be born, they'll go into foster care, what you're saying is that I'm not worth life, that I'm not worth yeah. who and what I am now. And so, you know, I I think that obviously – there are different voices on all things in here and people bring their perspectives in. But I've heard many former foster youth bring their perspective in saying, I am worth being alive. I am worth my everyday now. I'm worth the parenting I'm doing to my biological children right now. And you using me as an argument for why kids shouldn't be born is, is gross and wrong. Mm, What something I find interesting about that argument is you know they're obviously speaking about the trauma that that foster kids have gone through many of them um and and interestingly some have you know just maybe lost mom and dad and maybe they died in a car accident and they didn't have anybody else and that it lands them in foster care not everybody has experienced um i guess losing your parents is traumatic but the abuse that people typically think of um but we all experience trauma in life. I mean, good grief. I, I think of just the, the issue with COVID and when people, you know, were in their homes and businesses were being shut down and people were losing their jobs and people didn't have any money. Um, you couldn't find anything in the grocery store. I mean, there were so many issues surrounding that. Uh, people were missing diagnoses that they probably should have caught so that they go to the doctor. I mean, there was a lot of issues surrounding whether people agree or disagree with how COVID was handled. There was a lot of mishaps and things that should not have happened uh, that did because of how it all played out. You know, maybe grandma could have been diagnosed uh, prior and you you lose your grandmother as such. And so I, I feel like And myself, I have dealt with trauma in my life. And I feel like if you're using that as your basis, trauma, I mean, you're essentially saying nobody should be alive because we all go through things in life that can be very traumatic, some worse than others. Yes, absolutely. Um, But when it comes to some of these things, I I feel like we all kind of have that. Yeah. I mean, suffering is certainly pervasive to the human experience. It is something that we are all going to experience. And I think that there are real ways that we can look at this issue of, of children being born into homes where they're, they're not um, supported the way they need Mm -hmm. and actually bring in tangible change to the family systems, to the community systems. I mean, we know that the first couple of months are the most crucial in human development. We see research where if babies are neglected for the first couple months of their life and then cared for for the rest of their life, that their outcomes are far worse than children, babies who are cared for very well, and then receive um, horrific abuse for the rest of their life. The first couple of months are the most crucial to human development. So the question shouldn't be, are these kids worth being alive? The question is, when they're born, how do we come and build resilient children who who the trauma we like you said we all yes. experience trauma who they have the the brains and bodies that have been nurtured and cared for and supported so that they can 
endure the human experience that we all have of suffering. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's unbelievable to me that somebody would use that as an excuse to say, well, instead of fixing the issues that surround your circumstances, right. I'm just going to say you shouldn't be here. Right, right. I mean, I think that's the easy way out. The the thing that you do that involves a lot more effort is saying, I'm going to come alongside you and love you until we can figure this thing out. That's right. Um, there's another one. How would you respond to those who say, if we don't have abortion, foster care systems will be overrun? Um, I would respond by saying that it is an astute observation <laughs> that really brings up a, a true question, a, a true issue that we need to find an answer to. And so there, by God's grace, will be more babies being born. And probably that will look like more children entering foster care. So I believe that a big part of the answer is the church stepping into the foster care system. And it may even look like some of the efforts that we have been putting into um, overturning Roe v. Wade and and using our voices in the pro-life space to be using our lives now in the pro-life space yeah. to say, yes, we believe that these children are worth being born and we want to protect them. And now that they are born, we are committed to opening our hearts and homes to protecting them. So I think it's going to take um, certainly the state stepping up, but I would say even more so in what we can feel inspired and empowered to do is for the church to step up, for people to step into this space and be ready to support families, to welcome children into their home, to mentor and walk with new young moms who are under-resourced. We can, we can sort of put our money where our mouth is and, and jump into this space as more children are born by the grace of God. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, we have a lot of people who um, will say we have to have abortion to fix foster care. There are issues within foster care. We need to revamp foster care. I'm sure you've heard all of these arguments. I'm sure, sure you've heard anything. Uh, would you say that abortion is necessary to fix foster care? Absolutely not, because the point of foster care is protecting vulnerable children. We have an entire system that billions of dollars is put into that is devoted to protecting vulnerable children. And when we're talking about abortion, we're talking about the exact same thing, protecting the most vulnerable of children. So to me, the fact that, that the foster care and pro-life arguments are pinned against each other is just completely nonsensical because they are two sides of the same coin. They are both about protecting children. And to say that, that somehow one is going to affect the other, they are both about the same thing. They are both about these precious lives. Yeah, you know what I find interesting too is a lot of these children um, are born to parents who want them. Just That's like you right. said, they've fallen on hard times. That's right. Or you know, maybe maybe addiction creeped in. Maybe it's poverty. Maybe it's a housing issue. Maybe it's you know working multiple jobs to be able to support those child that they chose life children that they chose life for that they want. And so the idea that we need abortion to fix that it's kind of doesn't even make sense I when agree. you really think about it because. These are parents who chose, like abortion has been legal, and these are parents who chose life in this time of, of, of legal abortion right, sure. for their children because they wanted them. So right. that's not an answer. Like right. these are born to people who want them. I, I find that very interesting. You touched on this a little bit before. Um, does, the, does, the, uh, does the foster care argument for abortion harm children? Absolutely. If if kids hear the adults around them talking about if their lives are worth living, it is absolutely detrimental. The messages that I want my foster children and the kids that I serve to hear are that they are valuable, that they have dignity, that they were created by God, that they have purpose. And when they're used as pawns in political arguments, when human lives are used to 
to win an argument, what we're saying to these kids is you would have been better off to not be alive. Your parents would have been better off to not be if you were not alive. Our community would be better off if you're not alive. These are the really detrimental arguments that we use in these spaces, forgetting that the kids around us, the youth, and even adult former foster youth around us here, uh, and they're incredibly damaging. Yeah, so well said. So incredibly well said. And I know that I could talk to you forever, and I want to foster it one day, so I'm probably going to be messaging you all the time, Good. asking you all of the questions. Um, I previously did take my foster care classes and found out I was pregnant during I remember that you time. telling me that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my, my daughter's almost four now, and we're hoping to move soon. That might be it in the works. Um, I don't know. We'll see. But if that happens, we obviously would want to do it in a new state because you can't take sure. children That's in right. that way. So it, it's in my future. I know that. And my husband is completely on board. So I'm going to use you as a massive That's resource. Great. I can't wait to talk um, again. So for everybody else who um, needs other resources, what is the biggest resource that you use? So I think that it's important that we understand trauma as foster parents, that we build our hearts for the biological family, um, and that we're listening to former foster youth and adoptees about their experience. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love social media for that reason, that we can sort of do all of those things. I say read good books and live life with people who either are foster parents or have lived experience of foster care and and ask your questions and and befriend people. So yeah. social media is a gift, books are a gift and people are a gift. So never stop learning, never stop researching That's basically. Right. I have a few more questions that my followers submitted. Okay. You can be more brief in these answers if you want sure. to, but some of them were pretty good and uh they're sound like maybe from people who don't really understand foster care as a whole sure. or kind of believe the stereotypes that are out there. Um, somebody says there's a stigma about foster care and foster parents doing it for the money. What is your response to that? Uh, part of my response is that no one in their right mind would do this for the money because you open your home to the state, to um, trauma, to hardship. It takes over your life and your schedule and your heart. And the money simply is not worth it. Also, we end up spending um, a good amount of money. I mean, like we pay for private child care for our foster son right now because that's the best option for him. And yeah. while we are given everything that we need to care for him, there is certainly no world where this would be worth it to do it for the money. Right. So you're like, what money? Yeah, we, exactly. So nobody's profiting off of No, no. Care. I mean, the things that you see in the movies that can sometimes play out are someone with six kids who all sort of meet their own needs and, and end up experiencing neglect in foster care. That is yeah. a reality that sadly, disgustingly, sometimes happen. Um, but for those of us who are doing this with our, our hearts wide open, it's we're receiving the money that we need to care for them and nothing more. It's purely fueled by passion and, that's and right. love for these yep. kids. So um, is it true that most children in foster care are not adoptable? So we'll see that most of the children will experience reunification, which is the goal. And so yeah. when we're asking that question, we have to remember what the goal of the entire system is so that we are walking alongside that goal rather than in opposition to it. There are children waiting in foster care now. So when we talk about foster to adopt, there are waiting children who need a forever family, who have been in foster care for years. Um, and and are waiting for their their forever family to adopt them. In those cases, the parental rights have already been terminated, correct? Parental rights have been terminated. Most often, the kids are over the age of eight, are part of a sibling group, um, have medical special needs, um, and and there has just been not a foster parent who's been able to commit to them forever. Yeah. Okay. And how do you, very briefly, if you can share a little bit of how do you acclimate children to your home? Mm. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to give a brief answer to, right. but I will say that 
um, really just treating them like they are one of the pack in our experience because we have six kids. It's we welcome mm-hmm. them into the crew. I try to devote the day that they're with us to spending time with them, asking questions about their favorite foods, or if it's a baby or toddler, just sort of sitting on the ground with them for the day. I'm trying to clear our schedule for a week, spend a lot of time together, um, and just pull them into our unit as a family and help them feel safe and loved. I love that. Um, somebody says all of my friends who foster share similar experiences with lack of support and feeling isolated. How can we combat that? That's a great question for a friend to ask, because I think that the friend is part of the answer. So obviously the state needs to do better. There are many nonprofits that walk alongside foster families and support them. But I think the very best answer to this is when the church uh, and the community and friends and family really see it as their part of this mission of caring for children to care for their loved one who has opened their home to the child. So I think that we should support foster families the way we would uh, a new mom with gifts for the child, with meals, with offers to help and babysit and really see, okay, I'm not going to be opening my home, but part of my mission can be helping you do this. And so I'm going to walk with you as you do this and show up at the beginning for sure, but also show up with you throughout this journey by being an encouragement, praying for you, but also really practically serving you. Yeah, these are also things that people do oftentimes when you have a newborn and maybe yeah. you already have other kids. Right. You know, the meal train that you can do and helping out maybe with the other kids, taking them to the park, let mom take a shower. That's right. You know, things like that and doing them long term, not just, you know, right when the child arrives at their home. But that's right. They're, they're very normal things that we do when they're newborns in in the home. So why could we not also do those things when a foster child enters the home and support them that way? I think that's a beautiful way to walk out your pro-life beliefs and be able to support these people. Um, there, somebody says, this is actually one that you probably could answer really well because you kind of have the opposite, um, situation. Somebody says there's a black woman who fostered and adopted a white boy, but gets backlash often from both white and black people. Um, and you have a child who is not white that you have adopted. Um, how would you respond to that? How should the person who maybe adopted or fostered this child respond to that? Because really uh, this child is being loved by this yeah. person, obviously, if they went out of their way to adopt them. So what do, right. what do you say? So I would believe as well that that kids will most often do best in their culture in their um, racial identity. And if it's possible, that's that's something that we can give kids. What we see is everything in foster care is coming into a broken situation and seeking healing. So would it be best for a child of color to be raised in a family of color? Yes. And would it be best for them to be raised by a biological family? Yes. But what we're seeing now is how can we bring healing here? How can we say, okay, we're going to fight for uh, the next best thing and we're going to trust God for it. So I think part of it is that we simply have to not care what other people say, especially when they are not willing to enter this space with us. So when people are criticizing us from afar and they are not stepping in themselves, well, it's very easy to throw stones from afar. Um, But the reality is that these kids need homes. And if they're being loved and they're safe and protected, then we should be celebrating that. And we should be looking for ways to support this child in this unique experience that they're in. There are ways, especially, I mean, the majority of the time, when we're having this conversation, it is talking about white parents parenting children of color. And so I think the answer there is that we're surrounding ourselves with other people of color, that we're looking to um, build relationships with people who don't look like us and look like our children, that we're trying to give our kids their cultural identity uh, and heritage. So there are answers that are more than just, well, let's just be grateful that they're being cared for. But I think the core is, let's be grateful that that they are in a family where they are loved and protected. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody's going to have an opinion, right? right. I mean, you kind of just have to learn to shut that stuff you off do, at some point sure. in time. Give me two, two What is it, honey? If you open the door for me, I'll 
Okay, I'll be there in just a second, okay? Give me just a few more minutes. You're this fine. is real mom life, okay? I know. My baby Wait, is asleep in the can't. other room, and I'm, like, praying him to stay asleep. <laughs> she can't open the door for the dog, and the dog needs to go potty is what she's saying. Um, if you need to do that, you can go do that. It, it's fine. I just okay. only have two more questions. The dog sure. will survive. Um, okay. You touched on the uh, financial aspect of foster care. When it comes to adopting through foster care, how affordable is it? So adoption through foster care is always free. It is um, the home study process has already happened as you've become a foster parent and the legal fees and all of that is always covered by the state as well. So it is, it's free in, in that sense. There is obviously risk involved for people who want to build their family through adoption. Sure. I yeah. I always make sure that that I put that in that it's not just oh this is a free adoption option. It's no if you're becoming a foster parent, it needs to be that you have a willingness to adopt, an openness to adopt, but not a goal to adopt because yeah. you will most of the time say goodbye and you will all of the time be in opposition to what the rest of the system is trying to accomplish and it can be really frustrating and painful if that's the case. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is you, people should not go into foster no. care to adopt. No. You know, that shouldn't be their ultimate goal. It should be to support these families and love on these children. That's right. And then if the, the option presents itself, then obviously be willing to do so. That's right. Um, the last question that I ask every guest is if you could give people one advice or one piece of advice to speak out on these issues that we've talked about, whether it's foster care or the issue of life and abortion, what would that one piece of advice to encourage them to speak out be? Well, I think specifically tied to the foster care issue, I would come back to what you shared before about how do the children and the adults who are in foster care or were in foster care feel about this this argument of abortion that surrounds yeah. them. And rather than getting into screaming matches on the pros and cons, just to say, how would you feel if you were a child in foster care hearing this? Are we echoing in one space what we're saying in the other. When we're talking to foster children, we're talking about their value and their worth and their potential. Let us bring that same sort of value into the way we talk about abortion and foster care. Yeah, that's beautiful. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. I know it's been a while that I tried to get you on and I had to reschedule because of being sick. No, for a couple I'm so weeks, happy we finally connected. I same, same. I'm excited. And it's foster care month. So we're going to get the right. episode out as quick as we can to kind Great. of promote this and talk about foster care. And I will shoot you to or shoot people to your page. Where can people find you? I know you also have a book. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about that and where they can find you and then we'll sign off. Yes, it's foster the family, all the places. So the book is called foster the family on Instagram and Facebook. It's at foster the family blog. Awesome. You guys go follow her. You will not regret it. She is an, uh, she has abundant resources all of up here in her brain and she shares them on social media for all of us. Jamie, thank you for your time today. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for having me.